welcome to the August meeting, traditionally the hottest meeting of the year and one of the fewest attended as well, so good to see that it's not that hot this year, thank goodness. So this is an intro, this is a very high level 101 kind of presentation. When Jay originally approached me, he said, let's, let's do something that's 15 minutes, we'll have some samples, we'll chat a little bit afterwards. I kind of laughed because I've never done a 15 minute presentation in my life. But we're going to try to keep this uh, you know, short, sweet, high level, but there's an intention to what we're doing, and that is, as I say up here, hopefully the first of a series of presentations where we can build on the topics that we talk about each time. So a lot of new faces in here. Who here has not made cider before? Cool. Who here has not seen me do a presentation on cider? Cool. All right. Fresh audience. All right, so the goals of the presentation, give everyone the basic info to make a batch or two of cider. We have fall harvest season coming, and in Northeast Ohio, we're gonna literally be you know, drowning in apples end of August through November. Fantastic opportunity to get some, some local orchards. Uh, just perfect opportunity to do this. The goal then is to bring that batch that you make, that we're gonna talk about tonight, hopefully to the January meeting. Bring a gallon, bring a couple bottles, bring a keg, whatever you make. The goal here is to just make cider, bring it to that meeting, and we'll have the second session, which is where we're going to play around with dropper bottles. I did it about two years ago, where I brought different types of acid, different types of tannin, uh, different types of ways to sweeten it up, and we're going to work with what you make to basically dial it in to what you like. All right. Uh, again, to make this work, we need some of you guys to commit to basically say, yeah, I'll go buy a gallon or two gallons of cider, I'll ferment it, and then I'll bring it. Does that sound like fun? Yes. Cool. Yeah. What tonight's presentation is not. A deep dive into the science on any particular topic. I tend to like to do that. It's not a deep dive into advanced techniques, procedures, or competition strategies. Maybe that'll be one of the sessions for next year. All right, for each of those. I got into making cider because, you know, I was brewing like crazy, went to grad school, immediately ran out of time. So I didn't have eight hours to dedicate to a brew day. So you can make a batch of cider, uh, basically during halftime of a football game. All right, so everyone says, oh, I'm so busy. You're not so busy that you can't make cider. So what is it? Simply put, the fermentation of the sugars found in the juice of crushed apples. Uh, it's a one-to-one -one agricultural product. It doesn't get much simpler than that. Historical perspective, we could talk for hours about the history of cider in America. Uh, it came over from Europe. It was you know, basically endemic in the colonies from day one. Apples spoil quickly once you pick them. If you don't have the ability to cold store them, they tend to spoil. So people turned them into juice, which then turned into alcohol. All right, and that was basically what people drank in the colonies and then through really the late 1800s up until Prohibition. It was a safer alternative to water, which you know can be dicey at times. Uh, and in Europe, it was as popular as wine or beer. And again, up until really Prohibition here in the US, this was something that was consumed in massive quantities. You know, even kids were encouraged to drink cider. I mean, you died when you were 30, but you know, you drank cider up until then. Right now, uh, and it has been really for about the past decade, cider is, if not the fastest growing craft beverage, uh, something at like 800% over the last just five to 10 years. It's incredible. I mean, just it's a, an alternative beverage for people who want to drink something different. So why make it? The first thing I wanted to put up here was, well, it's alcohol. Right? For this group, I don't need to really explain that. But taste, it is an alternative to other things that you're used to. It's a variance, it's a different step from, you know, IPAs. Thank God. I mean, I love me some IPAs, but, you know, nine out of ten taps don't have to be the same thing. It's lighter, it's a little crisper, it's a little cleaner, uh, it cleanses the palate, so it's a nice change of pace, especially on a, a nice warm summer night. You are limited truly only by your imagination to what you can make. 
Uh, and it's gluten free. So for folks who have celiac disease or just gluten intolerant, this is a wonderful opportunity. I have four or five friends who are you know, gluten intolerant. I keep kegs of cider on tap at my house and they're always very happy. Low barriers to entry. Literally, if you've ever made a batch of beer, you have all the equipment you will need to make cider. Minimal time, as I mentioned, and minimal money. A gallon of cider at the grocery store costs about $5. If you're gonna make a gallon batch, that's the cost of your entry. It's not too bad. Flexibility, unlike beer, which is pretty much set when you finish your you know, work production and your hopping schedule, the fun with cider is that the, the flavor profiles really are just beginning. You're gonna play with it after it's done fermenting, which is a little different and more like wine, more like mead. All right, so where do we go to find descriptions of what we call cider? Well, obviously the Beer Judge Certification Program is the place to go for pretty much every type of style, every type of detail that you would want to know. I put the link there at the bottom. Uh, in 2015, when they came out with the new beer guidelines, they also came out with cider and mead guidelines. They're working on you know, constantly refining the descriptions. They're working on constantly refining the cider judge protocol. If you go to the BJCP website, there is a ton of information just about the process of making it, the process of judging it, the process of evaluating it, just like beer. Uh, so what are the things we describe? I know no one can read the CIDR score sheet, but I threw it up there just as an example of how detailed the evaluation process can be, especially those of you guys trying to look around the pillar, not a chance. But basically what you look at is, they've got the descriptors on the right, just like a beer score sheet. And what they're looking at is you know, the appearance, bouquet aroma, flavor, overall impression. And then the laundry list on the left are all the faults uh, or you know, flavor outliers that people might notice. So by reading that, you can get an idea of what it's supposed to be like and what it's maybe not supposed to be like. But we really look at a couple of things here, so aroma. A lot of people will always say, oh, I don't smell a ton of apples in that. Well, you know, the apple scent is very mild. It's not like a rose, it's not like a petunia where it's just a big flower in your face. You'll get a hint of, of apple-y you know, scent in there, but it's not gonna be over the top. Flavor, again, there should be the impression of apples, but a lot of that can be dictated by how well it's balanced. So we look at things called sweetness, you know, how much sugar is left in the cider when you're done. That is its own flavor. How is that balanced with acidity and tannin? A little more on that in just a minute. Appearance, uh, you know, is it clear, is it cloudy? What's the clarity? What's the carbonation? Is it effervescent like champagne or is it still? And everything in between is perfectly okay. And then the mouthfeel, you know, it should be there, there should be some body, but then it should be clean and crisp and really just not leave a cloying feeling in the mouth. So I'm assuming everyone in here has had a cider at some point in time, maybe even a good one. Uh, so we're gonna have a couple to taste tonight. And I, know, I do know that Tim brought a, uh, a strawberry sour cider on the back. So we'll talk about that in a minute as well. All right, so if you go to the BJ, BJCP guidelines, we're gonna talk about what's called New World Cider. Um, previously, there were a couple muddled ways of describing it. They've tried to break it out now to say New World as in you know, the apples that we have available to us here, as opposed to English or French, where they have apples that, you know, they have trees and orchards that are older than our country. Right? They grow a ton of very, very tart, very, very sour, nasty looking, ugly little apples that make amazing cider, all right? In the US, we don't grow those that much because you can't really sell them as an agricultural product. So here we make everything big. So if you've gone to the store, you see Macintosh, you see Granny Smith, you see, you know, uh, uh, Sages by me has 50 different apples, so I can keep talking about apples forever, but they're mostly dessert apples, things you would eat right off the tree, things that you would make into an apple pie. Dessert apples are not the ones that make the best cider because they just don't have as much of that tart acidity in them. So we're a little bit behind the eight ball versus what the, the Europeans can make, but we can make a wonderful cider here if you, you know, play around with it a little bit. So some things here again, I know that's a bit of an eye test. 
Uh, overall impression, it's a refreshing drink of some substance, not bland or watery. Sweet should not be cloying, dry should not be too austere. Appearance, clear to brilliant, pale to medium gold in color, exactly what you'd expect from the cider. Aroma, sweet or low alcohol ciders may have apple aroma and flavor. Dry will be more wine-like with some esters. Uh, Mouthfeel, again, medium body, some tannin, some acid. Um, comments, an ideal cider serves well as a session drink and suitably accompanies a wide variety of food. And then the, the statistics, so the OG just from cider when you crush it, it's going to be about 1045 to about 1065. Depends on the year, depends on your blend. Uh, I never actually even take the OG of my cider when I make it because it's always going to be in about that range to make about a 5 to 5.5% five beverage. All right, so a few notes on flavor components. I put this up there again, this is right out of the BJCP guidelines, more for the people who couldn't be here so they can read this, but let's talk about sweetness for a second. There are really five layers of sweetness as they've defined it here. When you ferment apple juice, it's going to go to zero, all right? This is not meat, this is not uh, a complex carbohydrate like a wort, it's straight, fructose. Yeast can just go to town. It's going to take about a week, but it's going to go to zero. Sweetness is added back, usually after the fact. That's a topic for a future talk. But when you ferment this, again, it's going to go down to about zero. It may go less than zero. Uh, you know, first time you do that, you think your hydrometer's broken. You know, I've had a, a cider go as low as like 0 0.092. All right, it's bone dry. But, so dry is um, you know, roughly 1.002 or less. There's no perception of sweetness. So it's just you're getting the astringency, you're getting the acidity, not a lot of sweetness on the tongue. Medium dry, uh, you're in the 10.02 to 10.04, slight hint. Medium kind of splits the difference. Again, you're 10.04 to 10.09. You're now starting to be able to notice some sweetness. For most people, if you hand them a bone dry cider and it's the first time they've had one, they're going to say, I don't like that because I don't know what to make of it. Most commercial ciders you get are in the medium to sweet, all right, because they know what sells. They know that the, the particular customer that's looking to grab a cider uh, may just as easily have reached in there to grab a wine cooler and they're expecting something a little different. And that's okay, it's a gateway cider. We've got one here tonight. But as you get more and more into ciders, you will kind of tend to go a little bit drier for the most part. So I tend to like the medium dry, touching up a little bit on the medium. Medium sweet, again, you're into 1009 to 1019, and then sweet, anything above really 1019. And that's where you're getting into dessert ciders. So you know, I like to do a, a maple syrup back sweetening and, and basically call it like a maple cider. But it's, it's a dessert cider. Uh, it's for sipping. It's, you're not going to have a pint of that. Like you can, but then you have diabetes. Uh, it's good, but it's just very different. All right. Acidity. So acidity in apples comes from malic acid. It's the acid that's present in the fruit itself. Just like uh, tartaric acid is what you get from grapes. They do taste slightly different. Uh, citric acid is often uh, used as well to add some acidity. To me, it has a little bit more of a sharper flavor. But any combination of one or the other will add a little um, brightness, a little crispness, and it will take a normally drab, bland, kind of lifeless liquid, a couple drops of acid, and all of a sudden it's a completely different beverage. For those of you who have been in here for the, you know, play with the dropper bottles with Todd, you remember what that's like. I know Emmett and I have talked about a couple different things with some of his meads. Uh, acid does a wonder. The other, Part of the, the trio of uh, the flavor components is tannin. So tannin is what provides uh, mouthfeel. In wine, they actually use the grape skins and they macerate those and they create tannin out of that. So the difference between, say, you know, a Chardonnay and a big uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. You know, one you taste and you're like, oh, that's great. It's there and then it's gone. You taste a big, chewy California Cab and you're kind of coats your tongue, you get that feeling that lasts for a while, that's tannin. A little bit of that is good, too much is not so good. All right, so again, everything here is in balance. 
A sweeter beverage should have a little more acid and a little more tannin. A lighter beverage can go, again, a little lighter on all three components. But that's what we're going to play with when we do the, uh, the modifications. So the styles as defined and organized by BJCP, um, again, you show this to you know, people in Europe and they say, well, that's not what we call them. Well, that's what we call them here in America. That's what we call them as home brewers. So again, New World Cider, it's what we make here in the States out of essentially table apples. English cider, French cider, basically dictate you know, where they're from. So English cider will tend to be a little sharper, a little tartar, uh, more acidity. You can actually get some that are, you know, I hate to say the term meaty, but there is actually a, you know, a little bit of a smoky or somewhat, I don't want to say ham, but again, if you've had a, a scrumby, sometimes you can go, hmm, a little, little bit of ham, a little bit of meat there, it's not bad. French is more like a, a, a complex French white wine. Again, typically effervescent, typically bone dry. Perry is fermented pear juice. Uh, again, a different change of pace, very tasty. Uh, pears are just naturally a little bit of a sweeter fruit, and they've got sorbitol in there that, that will make it all the way through th fermentation. New World Perry are you know, pears that we have here in the States. Old World Traditional Perry, again, Europe. Specialty cider in Perry, this is where your imagination can run wild. A New England cider is made with extra brown sugars. So you can use just straight brown sugar, you can use a little molasses, uh, and sometimes you can throw in uh, some raisins and you get a higher alcohol, a little more full body flavor. Cider with other fruit, again, that's basically anything you want to make. It's cherries, it's raspberries, it's peaches, it's apricots, it's limes, it's you know pretty much anything you can think of. Apple wine is cider with straight sugar added to it. And the goal there is to bump up the alcohol without bumping up the body. So you end up with what's you know basically an eight, nine, ten percent, very similar to white wine character. They're interesting, not for everybody. Ice cider. So this is not Applejack. You're icing the juice before you ferment it. So think about freezing five gallons of apple cider, which is kind of already sweet to begin with, and then you slowly let it thaw. The sugars will drop out first. The ice will stay. You know, suspended as crystals, and what you end up with is this incredibly sweet, you know, incredibly dense liquid that you then ferment after that, and that's obviously going to turn out to be a very dessert-oriented cider. Also, very time-consuming, very expensive to make. It's like ice wine. You know, you go buy a little, uh, you know, 375 split of ice wine, and you're like, wait a minute, that's 40 bucks? Well, yeah, because it took a lot of time and a lot of material to make it. Cider with herbs and spices. Specialty cider and Perry. Again, pretty much anything that your heart can dream up, you can enter it into a competition. And again, we'll play with those as well. Nathan? I'm sorry, did you say the ice cider is frozen pre or post fermentation? Yes, so ice cider is frozen pre fermentation. So you're fermenting an incredibly <coughs> concentrated sugar solution. Applejack, which is basically freeze distillation, is done after you make a cider. So you make your five gallons of cider. You wait till a nice cold day, or you've got a chest freezer. You put the keg outside till it gets a little slushy. So you're freezing the water crystals, and then you're pumping the the, the concentrated, you know, liquid off the top. There are the, just difference in process. Which is illegal, by the way. So you shouldn't do that on purpose. You should just accidentally leave it out on your porch. So we had this conversation. If Paul Schick was here, I would I would be having this conversation with him live right now. As home brewers, we can do anything we want to do with a home fermented beverage, except distill it. They still frown upon that, right? I've had this conversation with the TTB. They don't care what we do because it's non-taxed, you're not gonna sell it, and you're not making anything of super high potency. So if you wanna make Applejack, you wanna make a, an ice beer, go for it, all right? There, no one's gonna show up at your door I need to take your four gallons of, of ice wine, okay? But it's fun to experiment with. How long does it take that concentrate to ferment? So ice cider can take weeks, right? You're really stressing your yeast. It's a whole, uh, it, it comes from Quebec, and some of the products they're making now, if you ever had one, I mean, it, it'll tear the enamel off your teeth, it's so sweet, but it is 
It's ambrosia. It's really good. So what he just said is he did an experiment with exactly what we just talked about, whether you do it ice before or you do it after. And he preferred the ice cider before. Alright, so what do you need to make cider? Like I said, if you've ever made a batch of beer, even if it's just an extract batch, you have what you need. Carboy or other vessel that will hold between 1 and 5 gallons. Airlock, sanitizer, funnel, stirring spoon, simple stuff. And I intentionally put a gallon you know, jug on the left and a 5 gallon carboy on the right. You can use either. I know people who use the jug they bought the cider in. All right? You pour off a little bit, you stick in a, a, a balloon on top, voila. All right? You can't get much more simpler than that. Ingredients. You need juice. For this experiment, we're really talking about just simple store-bought stuff. So, you know, a gallon of Patterson's, they're out by me in uh, Chesterland. You can get Mott's, just pure apple juice from the Walmart, or you can get frozen concentrate. Or mix and match, do all of the above. If you can, try to find stuff that says it's been pasteurized, not that it's been preserved. All right, sometimes you'll see on there, it'll say may contain less than 0.1% you know, sulfites. That makes it a little harder to ferment, not impossible. All right, so again, we're coming up on fresh cider season. You should be able to go to most stores and buy it refrigerated right out of the, right out of the, uh, the refrigerated case. Yeast. You can pretty much use any kind of yeast you want. I've tried as many as 20 different yeasts at a time, just to compare, do I like wine yeast, do I like cider yeast, do I like beer yeast? Um, your mileage may vary. For purposes here, pick one. All right, there are a lot of dry cider yeasts that are available right now. There are obviously any number of different beer yeasts. Personal favorites, I like either a white wine yeast, a straight up cider yeast, or an English ale yeast. It's going to provide, for me, at least the best flavor profiles. I got a question for you. It's so, different yeast obviously has different uh, ABV limits. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, is there a, I guess, a preference to style to use yeast? So in this case, again, we're dealing with a product that's likely going to be around 1050, 1055. Any yeast you put in there is going to take it to zero. Oh. Yeah. And quickly. So again, for purposes of this, pick one that you know, use it, bring it in January. Todd, yes. If you were talking about the uh, ice, uh, the, the apple, apple wine. Mm -hmm. Could you use that concentrate right there instead of icing it? So what I I have used concentrate before to actually back sweeten because it's getting you all the apple flavor and all the sweetness in the world with a lot of water. That's more of an advanced technique that maybe we'll talk about at a future session. Okay. But if you wanted to just do a gallon of, of cider, yeah, you can buy enough concentrate, dilute it down with, with a gallon of water, and hit the gravity you want. Well, what if you diluted it to half? Could you make the uh, apple wine with that? You could. That's, that's a great question, Jay. You want to cheap uh, yeah. <laughs> I think we have an experiment waiting to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Yeah. All right, so Todd's extra simplified process. All right, since we're sourcing store-bought juice, it's already been processed, so we probably don't need to sterilize it. If you were buying straight out of an orchard, or you were, un you were unsure of how it's been handled, you'd throw in a Camden tablet, let it sit for 24 hours, and then start. Tim. But that's not feasible anymore because of what the law changed a lot about six years ago. Remember? Everything's UV and everything. You don't need to put Camden tablets in there. And they're not taking fruit off the ground anymore. There is no E. coli. So they said. Sure. So I am not sure you want to put the sulfur in your beer. You, I mean, I'm, and I'm not suggesting that we do it for this experiment either. This is like literally if you had a dozen apple trees in your backyard. Oh. And you do your own crush mm -hmm. and you're going to go old school. For this purpose, we're not worrying about that because you're going to buy it from the store. Uh, again, sanitize your fermentation vessel, little star sand, minute, you're good to go. If you're using dry yeast, follow the manufacturer's rehydration. If you're using liquid yeast, just pour it in. You do not need to do a starter. Aerated. Switch the carboy, stir the carboy. You have an oxygenation stone. Cool, you just need a little bit of oxygen. Nutrients. 
I like to say they're optional. I tend to not use nutrients in cider. Um, again, you're dealing with a straight fructose. It has a lot of nutrients, it has a lot of magnesium, it has a lot in there that the yeast are going to look for. Um, if you want to put a dash of zinc or yeast energizer or DAP, feel free. It's not going to hurt it. Temperature, you can do it in the low 60s to garage temp right now. All right? It's pretty forgiving. Fermentation is going to take about a week. Uh, and at the end of that week, you're going to probably still have a little bit of a cloudy liquid, but it's going to end up, again, right about the, the level of water. You can let it settle, you can cold crash it, you can do both. Transfer it to a new vessel, so get it off that yeast. Uh, keep it refrigerated, put it in a keg, a carboy, a bottle, whatever package you prefer. And then uh, bring a few bottles to the January meeting and we are going to have a blast. All right. Did I just leave out about 40 steps that I normally do? Yeah, I did, on purpose. Again, extra simplified. I want everyone in here to be able to do this in 20 minutes or less. You did this in 15 minutes. There you go. So I was going to ask about pectin, but then... That's an advanced topic. Why, why complicated? <laughs> That's an advanced topic. Handling oxygenation. How much of a problem? What, what do we have? Do we have to worry about that? No. Can we pour it from... Okay. Yeah. It's, again, incredibly forgiving. All right. Pot potential future topics. So Paul led me right into this. We'll talk about some post-fermentation flavor balancing at the January meeting. Uh, advanced techniques and processes we can talk about. Back sweetening, what to use, how to do it, how to stabilize it when you're done so you don't create bottle bombs. Uh, sourcing apples or making custom juice blends. Sterilization versus using wild yeasts. Again, apples are covered in yeast. This is a, an interesting process, just like making wine. Finishing techniques, do we use pectic enzyme? Uh, how do you filter, how do you use clarifying agents? All of these are options. Yeast experiments, flavor comparisons. We can do style explorations. We can talk about each of the categories of the BJCP. We can play with spices. We can play with fruits. Um, upping the alcohol. So that's a New England, an apple wine. Or, you know, sizers, which is basically you dilute honey with cider and you make a blended product that's called a sizer. Sizers are delicious. And anything else the group wants to, to cover? Apple butter sizer is, uh, yeah, Tim's the uh, resident ABC expert. All right, tonight's cider samples on your table. Everybody should grab a bunch of glasses. So most of you should have um, four different products. We're going to go in this order. So Virtue Cider is the green can. All right, so they are heirloom apples out of Michigan. They use champagne yeast. It is very bubbly. It's 6.7% ABV and it is very dry. So we picked this one to kind of show you an example of you know, how you can go dry on the commercial side. The next one is going to be in the red can. That's uh, from Original Sin. That is an all Macintosh blend. Uh, so single varietal, that's about 6% ABV and that I would call a semi-sweet. Wicked Grove. I picked this one because you can buy it at Aldi. So if there's a more ubiquitous you know, product out there, then I don't know what is. Again, that's going to be about 5% ABV. That's in the, one of the bottles. Semi-sweet. What I would say most people think of when they think of commercial cider. And then the last one I want you to try is the one that I bottled. That's in the marked one with the, the obvious homebrew cap. That's one that I did from last year's uh, Snob's Big Bulk Buy. So I typically get about 40 gallons from that. I'll split it into a whole bunch of carboys and then have a blast just with either different yeasts or I'll make some ginger cider, I'll make some cherry, I'll do sangria, like whatever. So that one I use Cider House Select Premium Cider Yeast. I age that on an oak spiral soaked in bourbon. So you will notice oak. All right, and that's on purpose. Uh, about five and a half percent finishing gravity is basically water, so that one is also bone dry. Uh, and then I did very little adjusting. I touched the acid a little bit. The tannins coming from the oak. So that's an example of where we can get something that you make with very very minor modifications. So if you like it, that's great. If you don't, lie to me, and uh, we'll just pretend you want to make something else. All right, so everyone by now should have had a little bit of the brute. Yes. Too dry? 
So the first thing you get from this one, obviously you get a little bit of a cider flavor, but then there's acidity there, right? There's no doubt. You're not getting a lot of sweetness. There's nothing cloying on the tongue. And actually there's a decent little bit of tan in there because all of a sudden you feel your tongue and it's kind of dry, right? In, in a sweeter cider like the next one we're gonna have, you're gonna feel that sweetness for a longer period of time. Dry, brute, whatever you wanna call it, it's there. It's refreshing. It's going to cut through any acid or cut through any fat or any uh, you know meat that you've been eating, and boom, it's just you know your tongue is ready for the next sip. When you hand some people a cider this dry, you can get the same reaction you get when you hand somebody a dry white wine or a dry red wine, and their face puckers and they look at you like you just hurt them. That is everyone in my family. So imagine, you know, me making hundreds of gallons of this stuff a year and my family drinks nothing but, you know, like super sweet muscat wine that uh, tastes like Kool-Aid. So I don't know where I came out of in that family tree, but certainly not the rest. All right, so grab the uh, red can next. You did it in the wrong order already? I mean, I put it on the board. <laughs> I really couldn't get the instructions more explicit. You're just you're taking it. You're an advanced. You're an advanced table. That's all. Okay, I'll talk less. Drink more. All right, so again, this one definitely. You know, you get that apple kick. A little less acidity. All right, a little less tannin. Definitely sweeter, right? But not so sweet that you kind of go, ugh. Right. This, this is cloying. The one I was trying to find was um, Angry Orchard. It wasn't available when we grabbed it from uh, Red Wine and Brew. That right now is what I would call the Budweiser of commercial ciders. It's tasty. You may be able to drink more than one, depending on how hot it is. But, you know, you have it, you're just kind of like, eh, that's a wine cooler. Right. Okay, but you know what? They sell a ton of it. Who's the distributor? Uh, Angry Orchard. Yeah. That's uh, Sam Adams. Yeah, makes that. Yep. Yep. They have their own, I think, 800 acre orchard in New York. So I mean, they grow their own apples. They're as close to you know doing it old school as you can, but it's obviously a mass produced product. All right. Uh, I think most of you have the bottle. That's the Aldi product. Oh, yeah. The Wicked Grove. I actually don't have one of these, if I can take a little taste. There are ten other tables. Alright, so this one is not unpleasant, it's just different. Right? So this is what I like to say is the effect of artificial sweeteners, right? So it's as if you took the Macintosh, and then you put a little bit of a, a pink packet or a yellow packet or a blue packet, a coffee sweetener into it, probably saccharin, right? But they've kind of given it an artificial sweet flavor. Yeah. Too sweet, I heard. Give it to your kids. Yeah, put this in a bottle, it's great. Kid, kids will go to sleep early. Juice pack. Yeah, to me on this one, like I set my glass down 30 seconds ago, and I'm still getting a little bit of a pinch in the cheek, you know, from that, what I call that artificial sweetness. There's a reason I brought the Holiday 5 pack to this meeting. Because we opened one and said, oh, I have a great place to take the other five. <laughs> All right, and then the last one's the one that I made. So if you haven't opened up the unmarked bottle. So after that very sweet one, again, we're kind of reversing gears and we're going to dry. So again, bone dry, no back sweetening, 
touch of acid, you're going to get some oak, and you're going to get a little bit of that bourbon flavor because that's what I soaked the staves in. So all told, I think total prep time to make this, you know, was probably 20 minutes. Uh, and the nice thing is, you know, you just throw the oak stave in there and you walk away from the keg for two months, and that flavor just comes out. It, it provides a soft tannin on the background. So I did bourbon, I did vodka, I did brandy, I did um, Captain Morgan, I did straight rum, all sorts of different staves, and you know, put one in each different type of keg. And at the end, I still think the bourbon was probably my favorite. The brandy's a little sweeter. Captain Morgan obviously is you know, very much in the background, but it just goes to show that you can have as much fun experimenting with whatever you want. And if you get one you don't like, blend it into one you do. What's that? These were all five gallons. These were all in a keg. Yeah. So again, I did 40 gallons and kind of split them eight ways. Uh, what was your question? Uh, the cheapest I can find. So usually Evan Williams, just a decent flavor, but you know, you're, you're soaking oak in it and you're going to throw it into a keg. So don't waste Maker's Mark, don't waste something good. The flavor is not going to come through. Okay. All right, so next steps for you. Please commit to making a batch or two this fall. A gallon, two gallons, three gallons, five gallons. Uh, if you already make cider and you're an experienced cider maker, please participate. Bring your product to January and we'll compare. Uh, you know, last thoughts, enjoy tonight's New World Cider examples. Yeah, I mean, that's. Does anybody have any questions, any comments on anything we talked about or any of the samples? Tim? I just want to comment on, so I put a big, uh, you know, a bug two, in this two cider two recipe in the back. Okay. So I just have to count it back. I guess the orchard burned down a few years ago. So your strawberry sour is about five years old. Yeah. Okay. Did you put bread? What did you put in it? On the uh, White Labs at 747 or whatever. It's like the mixed culture? It's a liquid lack of a sauce. Okay. Um, and that's just, it's keeping it bright and keeping it alive. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a lot. It's, it's amazing how... So what Tim made is going to be really similar to what would happen if you, you know, just did a press and you didn't sterilize it, you just let the wild yeast go crazy. Because on the surface, you're going to have everything he just mentioned. You're going to have lacto. You're going to have Brettanomyces. You're going to have Pedicacus. The hope is that, you know, it gets flavorful without getting rancid. You know, you don't want butyric acid. You don't want... Uh, unpleasant flavors. You don't want acetic acid. So I took a taste of his back there. And he's a perfect example of a, of a nicely sour cider. Uh, you know, little touch of acetic on the back end, that's age. That's five years of, of aging, which just kind of, it, it's doing some things. The alcohol is being consumed by other bugs. But again, another example of you can do anything you want with this stuff. It's a fun little quick project. And if at the end you make something you didn't like it, you know, the sewer's right there, you didn't have a lot of time in this. So Paul's comment was on uh, carbonation for the most part. So the one I had there, yes, was, was very carbonated. Uh, and that was not by accident. When I laid these down, you know, again, a year ago, I laid them down in about 40 PSI. Now, there aren't the same proteins in cider that there are in beer to create foam. So you can overcarbonate a cider, and it's going to be effervescent, it's going to be spritzy, but you don't get the foam over Right, because I tend to like mine with a little more spritz in it. Um, and it makes it easier for bottling. So I bottled that, you know, yesterday, and, and you're having it today. You didn't use any carbonation. So again, that's something you, you like still. Go for it. You like effervescing. Go for it. Anything in between. Yep. Mike, can we put this presentation on the website for people to review it afterwards? And if you all make cider, refer to the tools to work with and work to get the website running. It will also be on YouTube. Yeah, but we have a video tonight. Hello, everybody. 
in between the video and the presentation, ask me questions, let's have some fun, you've got some time, you've got some time to make some mistakes, even. So, uh, we'll see each other again in January, hopefully the new president uh, keeps to that schedule, and uh, let's have some fun. Thanks everybody.